Hello and welcome to this revision podcast on the opposition to the Tsar 1855 to 1881. Let's have a look at the history of opposition to start off with. Uh, right from the start of the 1800s, people were sent away to study abroad in other countries from Russia and they brought back ideas that were contrary to autocracy. In 1825, the Decembrists had tried to overthrow um, Nicholas I at the start of his reign, and that was part an aristocratic coup over his succession and part a liberal intellectual foreigner to the later opposition groups who wanted a change to autocracy. The intelligentsia. It doesn't really translate well into English, but it's a critical thinking minority who are, crucially, separated from power. They don't have any power or any role in power. They became two groups, Westerners and Slavophiles, and the intelligentsia in 1855 took ideas from both groups, wanting to modernise, but also criticising some Western ideals and ways. They did not agree with autocratic values, and therefore, in opposition, this made them search for absolute truths rather than practical realities. This made them fanatical in their convictions, and they then took to ludicrous extremes. Stopping short was often seen as moral cowardice rather than compromise. But this was because they had no power. They were a very small number of them in 1855, hundreds rather than thousands even, and their number did not really grow rapidly in the 1860s. However, they were still important as they were the only ones who were writing in Russia at all, and so the radical groups that developed in the 1870s were all a result of these men. Plus, their small numbers made them more desperate when they failed to politicise the masses. They also had no political outlet, no National Assembly to voice their ideas and let off steam, and nowhere to go. Before 1864, they had no regional assembly to express themselves either. Their size and influence increased in the 1870s, as law courts produced lawyers capable of debate. Zemstivers gave them a forum for that debate as well. When did they start becoming revolutionaries? After the Zemster was set up in 1864 and called for a central Zemstva that was re- rejected by Alexander and he closed down the St. Petersburg Zemstva, exiling the prominent figures, this forced those looking for an outlet into more radical groups. When the Tsar became more reactionary and even repressive under the Shuvalov and the Third Section after the attempts on his life in 1866 and 1867, the gradual growth in revolutionary activity increased. However, for the most part, apart from assassination attempts, it was peaceful. Nihilism. Nihilism was adhered to by some of the younger generation in, 18, in the 1860s. They wanted to sweep away all that had gone before them and build a new society. They believed in reason and science and were hostile to the Tsar and the Orthodox Church. They were blamed for the fires and disturbances in the universities in 1862. Nihilism can be seen as a precursor to populism, although it's not strictly the same. Young Russia were a, gro- a group of young students um, who published this in 1862, and it argued that the revolution was the only way forward. Marxism. Marxism began to circulate through the young extreme radicals in the late 1860s. Bakunin translated the first copy of the Communist Manifesto into Russian in 1869. Marxist stage theory proposed that a country would go through six key stages, of which Russia was in the feudal stage and had to go through capitalist, socialist and finally communist stages. Marx thought Russia was the least likely country to have a communist revolution, In 1870, its message seemed irrelevant to a predominantly rural state with hardly any proletariat, who were the working-class factory workers. And um, even fewer bourgeoisie in Russia at this time, the middle-class factory owners. Let's have a look at key individuals. The need for action was encouraged by these socialist intellectual thinkers. Herzen, he was the son of a wealthy Russian nobleman. He vowed to avenge the Decembrists. He was exiled in London but edited the Bell periodical. And he believed in the superior of the peasant who was, um, had an instinctive socialism, according to Bakunin, uh, to Herson. But unlike Bakunin, he advocated a socialism based on the mere, uh, kind of like a miniature self-governing republic, rather than anarchy. With the mere as a commune, Russia could progress to socialism before going through capitalism. He lost support and readership when he took the side of the Poles in the Polish revolt in 1863. Chernyshevsky. He was the most popular and influential populist contributor to the contemporary journal um, and most popular amongst radical intelligentsia, and he believed in individual freedom. He agreed with Herzen that the mere could enable a path to socialism without capitalism. He did not like the liberals as they were pro-aristocracy, and, that, and he thought that liberalism would bring greater hardships than the Tsarist autocracy even had done. He wrote, What is to be done? 
when he was in prison, adv- and this advocated a socialist state. The title was copied knowingly by Lenin later. It was mistakenly let through by the censors. It sympathised with the poor, predicted a utopian socialist future and became the bible for Russian revolutionaries. He was dismayed by the violence done in his name. Bakunin. He was an anarchist, rejecting the state and its army, its laws, its church and its bureaucracy, etc. He believed in the superiority of the peasant, but he wanted to change society not from above, but from the uh, creation of new institu- or the creation of new institutions, but from below by getting the intelligentsia to move closer to the masses. He thought the intelligentsia should merely be there to help the peasants realise the untainted ideals that they always had but had not been aware of. So that's individuals. Let's have a look at the opposition groups. The opposition to Alexander II ranged from the most mildly behaved zemstvo liberals through universities to merchants and even kulaks resentful after remaining restrictions uh, were imposed after they were emancipated. Tchaikovsky Circle. Between 1869 and 1872, a group of young revolutionaries became established in St. Petersburg to share books and knowledge that had been banned. They found, founded a secret press and put forward propaganda leaflets asking for a to the people approach, like that called by, for by Herson in 1869. But they did not believe the peasants were ready for an uprising yet. These are the forerunners of the populist or Narodnik movement. So let's have a look at the Narodniks. They were populists, and they ranged from being dreamy romantics to desperate terrorists. In 1869, Herson asked the people, um, the activists, to go to the people. And this happened in 1874 and was a spectacular failure. Thousands went into the countryside to politicise the peasants, win them over to socialist ideas and serve up a rebellion by referring to redemption payments and other taxes. The peasants couldn't understand what these strangers dressed as peasants wanted. They still loved their little father, the Tsar, and blamed problems on corrupt officials and nobles. Often the Narodniks were denounced and arrested by the authorities, and this is where the 50 and the 193 of the trials of the same name came from. The Narodniks tried again in 1876, dressed as teachers or officials, to gain the respect of the peasants. Again, they failed, so they retired to the cities to reconsider their strategy. In 1877, they became Land and Liberty. Land and Liberty. They were better organised and more radical than the Narodniks or populists. They advocated Bakunin's anarchic view that Russia's land should be handed over to the peasants and the state should be destroyed. In 1878, show trials had upped their ambitions from low-key recruitment to going to work in peasant communities. Again, it didn't work despite them living with the peasants for long periods to try and understand their mentality. They issued a pamphlet in 1878 called A Death for a Death. They worked secretly with Zemstra in 1878 to try and bring about constitutional change. They did create the first unions for industrial workers in Odessa in 1875 and St. Petersburg in 1878. They split into two in 1879 after another assassination attempt uh, on the Tsar and they became both Black Partition and the People's Will or Narodnia Volia. Black Partition. These favoured peaceful methods and the partition of the Black Soil provinces amongst the peasants. They worked amongst and with the peasants. They were organised from St. Petersburg by Georgi Plekhanov, who became the father of Russian Marxism. Many of them turned to Marxism after the group ceased to exist in 1881 and became the Social Democrats. Plekhanov became a Menshevik in 1903. The People's Will or Narodnia Volia. These favoured terrorist methods. They were bigger than Black Partition. They were led by Mikhailov, who, a plant, who had a plant in the third section. In, eight, in sem, September 1879, they sentenced Tsar to death formally and tried to blow up his train with three bombers, but all of them failed. Three days later, they agreed to spare the Tsar's life as if he agreed to a constituent assembly, which the Tsar and his government ignored. They then managed to get carpenters to blow up the win- part of the Winter Palace, but the Tsar survived this bomb as well. Loris Malikov was put into power and he was and he infiltrated the group. Many were arrested and the rest became desperate to act before they were all rounded up. They eventually killed the Tsar with two bombs on March 13, 1881. Five of them were hanged for the assassination. Nationalist opposition. Poland was separate to Russia as a kingdom of Poland, but the Tsar was the king of Poland as of 1815. The first Polish rebellion in 1831 had resulted in restriction of the constitution, the parliament and the language. When Alexander became Tsar, he seemed to be friendly to Poland. This led to demands to re-establish nationhood, which no Tsar could approve and he caused a largely rural rebellion in Poland, which was crushed by Russia. 
who then resorted to Russification. The government's response to opposition. It was firstly repression and reaction. Infiltration of revolutionary organisations, show trials, six military governed generals and rigorous censorship. By 1880, more liberal methods like the Loris Malikov constitution were tried. The trials of 50 and 193 and the trial of Vera Zulich. Revolutionary groups made serious gains in support after 1874 when the government put those Narodniks it had arrested on show trial to try and discourage other revolutionary activity. The two most famous trials were the trial of 50 and the trial of 193. In this second one, between 1877 and 1878, the defence made impassioned speeches criticising the government, which was published throughout Russia, and the idealism and integrity of the defendants made an impression on the public and the jury. 153 of the 193 were acquitted, and the 30 who were found guilty were given lenient sentences. The Vera Zazulich trial. The day after the verdict in 1878, Vera Zazulich, a member of Land and Liberty, shot and injured a general for ordering a soldier who had not saluted to be flogged. She was put on trial and again made a great impression on the public and the jury. She was acquitted despite all the evidence that she had done it and the crowd applauded and spirited her away to Switzerland so she couldn't be arrested again. All this made the government look incompetent and powerless. They made all cases of terrorism subject to special courts and secret ones as well, but the damage was already done. Other assassinations. General Mezentsev was assassinated in reprisal for hunger strikers in St. Petersburg. Prince Kropotkin was assassinated, and in many of these cases, the perpetrators escaped. The Congress of Berlin in 1878. The Russians had won the war against Turkey in 1877-78, and the Treaty of San Stefano was signed, which served Russia's interest in protecting the Slavic people, which is known as Pan-Slavism. Britain and Austria made it clear that they wouldn't accept this, and they revised it at the Congress of Berlin, resulting in the Treaty of Berlin. Although it wasn't... Got a great defeat for Russia, inside Russia it was seen to be so, as it abandoned pan-Slavism and looked like a humiliating reverse. So feeling against Alexander increased even further. Assassination attempts on the Tsar's life. The first attempt was by a student, Karakazov, who shot at him in the streets of St. Petersburg in 1866. The second attempt was when a Pole tried to kill him in Paris in 1867. Much later there were a few more attempts. The third attempt was an ex-student and ex-teacher, Soloviev, who tried to shoot him and acted on his own, not with the consent of London Liberty, but this is the event that splits London Liberty into black partition and people's will. And this is in April 1879. The fourth attempt was by people's will. Three bombs planted to blow up his train. One is avoided by going a different route, one failed to explode, and one blew, blew up the wrong train. And that was in December 1879. The fifth attempt was also by people's will, and it would attempt to blow up a bridge in St. Petersburg when the Tsar's carriage was going over it. The date of that is unknown. The sixth attempt was um, also by the people's will again, and it was Kalturin Pazin the carpenter blew up the dining room of the Winter Palace. Forty Finnish soldiers died, but the Tsar was late for dinner and escaped, and that's February 1880. And the last attempt, the seventh attempt, was people's will, which actually succeeded. A bomb was thrown under the Tsar's carriage after coming back from the Sunday parade. It missed the Tsar's carriage, but one he got out to inspect the injured. Another bomb was thrown at him, which takes his legs off and eventually kills him. And that was in March 1881, March the 13th, the day that he'd signed um, the proposals for a constitution. So what was the uh, significance of the opposition? They were a very small amount of revolutionaries and an even smaller group of terrorists. But Marxism had taken hold, and revolutionary thought had become more definite. The Tsar had been prepared to concede reforms from above, but even liberals in the Zemstvo were considering reforms from below. Opposition from the right also had an effect. By giving in to it and becoming more reactionary, the Tsar increased the hostility of the reformers and the revolutionaries. The inability of the Tsar and his government to deal with a few terrorists and the failure of the show trials in the third section seemed to demonstrate a lack of direction and authority.